How's it going, everybody? Thank you so much for um, being with us tonight. Um, it's, it's an honor for me to be here with you. And thank you to everyone who purchased kits. We hope the pickup process and ordering process was smooth and easy. And we hope you come back and visit us at Village. And um, if you like some of these beers, we can find you more that you know, you're know you gonna love. So um, let's just dive right in. And I'll go through the order of the beers that we're gonna be tasting tonight. So you can kind of take out um, the first one. So the first one we're gonna be tasting is the Hanukkah Crush Hellas brewed right here. Um, second one we're gonna taste is the Maui Hazy Big Swell. And the final beer is the Gulen Rock 9000. So if you want, you can leave the others two um, in, the, in the fridge or in your cooler and uh, let them stay cold. But for now, if you wanna crack the first one, let's get that open. And I got a cold one here. Um, whatever glass choice, we'll go, kind of go over glasses later. Um, as you can see, I have a, an array of glasses here. Um, so uh, you pick the glass that works best for you. I, uh, my preferred glass for light loggers or loggers of any type or Hefeweizens is um, this sort of glass is sort of an in-between between, between a, a classic Pilsner glass and a Hef glass. Um, what I love about this glass in particular is that it allows you to pour out a full 16 ounces with a good amount of foam and head um, and it all fits in the glass um, and it's also it's a pretty glass you can see it all so um, this is a beer that we village bottle shop and Hanukkah collaborate on at village we do not brew any beer we are a specialty beer retailer and a, a, a beer cafe is what my partner Darren and I like to call call the shop and really what we do is to find the the best beers and the beers that get us excited and beers that get everybody excited and um, provide them to to the public so but what we love to do is uh, go into breweries and we still like to be a part of the brewing process. So we've collaborated with a lot of other breweries on island and it's really fun. And this is a, this is a beer, um, the second year we've actually brewed it with Hanakoa and um, it's called Crush Hellas. So um, it is a German style Hellas and Hellas just means um, bright, it's light. And it's a, it's a, it's a German light lager uh, from Bavaria. And if you can see when you pour it out, it's pretty crystal clear, beautiful straw, pale color. Um, this is a very, very simple beer. And it's, uh, the beauty of it is the simplicity that goes into it. But that simplicity makes this style and, and the lager style the most difficult beer to brew. When you think about it, there are really only four ingredients in this beer. There's malt, water, hops and yeast, and that's it. Um, so when you're, making, when you're making these type of beers, there's nowhere for flaws or imperfections or impurities to hide. You're gonna, you're gonna taste it. Um, there are other beer styles that can hide flaws very easily with other flavors, but in, in lighter lagers, you can't hide them. So the reason why we were passionate about making this style of beer, and, and we shared that passion with Hanako and Josh from Hanako, who's the head brewer here, is, um, you know, there are not a ton of loggers being made um, in the craft world, um, especially here on the islands. There are a few great ones that have been made here in the islands, um, but loggers are very difficult to made as, make, as I, as I mentioned, and they also take a long time to make. So the cost of making these beers, even though the ingredients are very simple, the time involved in crafting a beer like this really is much longer than, say, an IPA, which you can put out in, in two-thirds of the time. So with this beer, we went into it looking to do something much, much more traditional. And the, the ingredients are pretty simple. It, it's basic Pilsner malt, a touch of Munich malt, and I have some malts here and we'll go over those um, ingredients, and uh, a third malt called a sigillated malt. It's traditional German Hollachauer Middlesex um, hops, yeast, and local water. Um, it's brewed and then goes into the fermenter and it ferments the normal amount of time. So this beer did about two weeks in the fermenter. Um, with lagers, you have the, the, the length of the time comes from the lagering process, which is basically your cold cellaring this beer. And this beer sat for seven weeks in a tank. And in those seven weeks, it allows the beer to uh, clarify, it gets clearer, the flavors start to mold together a lot better. Without that lagering time, you're going to end up with more off flavors. And you're not going to get as clear and brilliant of a beer. So um, 
you take it up on the nose and you're going to get a lot of that malt characteristics. And that's something that the Hellas style um, is really known for. And I'll go into some of the differences between say like a Hellas and maybe a Pilsner's that you're, you're, you might be familiar with or American light lagers. Um, the Hellas really puts a, a focus on the malt. There still are a decent amount of hops in here, but it's not bitter in any way. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be a soft roundness of malt flavor. Um, so with the Hellas, it was created in Bavaria um, as a sort of reaction to the Pilsner that was created in Bohemia, which is just across the border in the Czech Republic. Um, and Pilsners tend to be much more hoppy um, they're not anywhere near as an IPA hoppiness, but um, in, in the world of lagers, they tend to use a lot more hops and the focus is there a lot more. With the Hellas, it's meant to be um, a little bit soft on the hop characteristics and it's a blend. And the reason being is for centuries in Bavaria, um, the dominant beer was a dark brown ale. And um, Bavarian drinkers were very used to softer, fuller, malter, maltier flavors. So when this beer came to be in the late 1800s, um, they had to figure out a way to make it uh, approachable to, to Bavarians. And to do the kind of higher hopping rates that they did in Pilsen and in the Czech Republic, it wasn't going to work for the, the residents of Bavaria. So they tampered down the hops a lot and brought in more of that crisp maltiness character. Um, common characteristics that you, you, you hear people say is it's got like a, almost a crackery biscuity note. Um, you got a very soft, um, rounded white bread kind of flavor on there. And the hops um, are traditional German style um, Holler Tower hops. They're grown in Bavaria. Um, they call, they're called noble hops. Um, and the noble hops are from the European continent. And this hop, Mahaler Tower, is very soft. Um, it's got a little bit of sort of um, fresh cut grass, a little bit of citrusy spice. Um, and it's, it's not meant to be overpowering tropical fruit notes in any way. Um, it blends in very nicely with, with the malt characteristics on it. So um, from this, you know, we took this beer and you know, it's something that we enjoyed making and, you know, we're hoping that more lagers can be made in the islands. Um, it is a difficult thing. It is very time consuming. And a lot of times with the craft brewing world, um, the focus has always been on ales. And that's because, again, they're quicker. They make, they, they're able to be put out a lot faster. But there is a growing trend now in craft brewing back into quality um, lagers. So, um, and the, there's a big difference between small scale craft lagers and the big scale lagers that you might see. And those are called macro brews. Um, and they're made in completely different styles and you're gonna be able to taste the difference. So the big difference, say if you take something like this to say your normal macro light beer, um, a lot of those beers are made um, with not 100% malted barley. They use rice or corn or um, byproducts of either one of those ingredients. And the reason being is it's a lot cheaper to make that way and it also lightens out the beer considerably. The other thing they do in the big breweries, um, they call high gravity brewing. And basically what it is, it's a shortcut to, get, to getting to the beer. So what they do is they brew a really, really strong batch of beer. And when they brew that big, strong batch of beer, um, it's at a higher gravity. So that's the amount of sugar in, in the wort. Um, and then what they do is after that, they water it back down to get to the desired um, alcohol content. Um, and it's a really easy and quick way to produce a lot of liquid at once. And then when you're brewing on that scale, um, that's really important for them on a, on a financial side. But I think on the craft side, going back to the roots of the traditional styles of brewing and taking the time and effort, lagering it for a, a, a long amount of time, it's really important. And you can taste it. I mean, you can taste it in a beer like this that has no impurities, no imperfections. It's crisp, it's refreshing, 
something you want to drink on a hot day. Um, and it's also something you want to drink of a Pauhana. Now, um, the dirty little secret in the brewing world is most brewers love to drink these type of beers. You know, it's, um, it's their shift beer. It's the, when they get done, most brewers, a lot of um, our employees, this is the beer they're gravitating towards because it's just refreshing and it's there and there's nothing to, you know, there's not too much going on, but that's a really, really nice thing. Um, so I mentioned um, ingredients. So with this beer, like I said, there were three, di three different malts that went into it, but there are dozens of different malts that are out there. And basically malt is just barley. So it's malted barley. And the way they get, as you can see, there's a couple different colors here. This one's much darker. This is a chocolate malt. And this is pale malt. And this is a very light caramel malt. So all it is, is malted barley and then it's roasted. Um, so basically what they do is they take it into a kiln and they roast it. How long you roast it, sort of like coffee, is how dark it gets. Um, the process is very similar to coffee. It's indirect heat, so you don't get any smoke, you don't get any of that flavor, and you very gently roast the malt. So obviously the chocolate malt has been roasted for a lot longer than the Pilsner malt or the two roll malt. So this is the typical type of malt that's the base of most beers. Um, it's either called, you know, it's two roll pale malt, or in this instance for, for our crushed Hellas, it was German Pilsner malt. But it's very light, not very dark, because um, if it gets any darker, your beer is going to get a lot darker in color. And we'll see the darker color when we get to the Gudendrock. So the Gudendrock is going to be a much um, darker color, and that's because of the malts that were used. Um, with the chocolate malt, it's actually, if you were to crack it open or taste it, it's got a very kind of bitter, bitter roasty note. It almost smells like roasted chocolate or coffee. Um, or, you know, when you get, if you get roasted cacao beans, this is really what it smells like. And that flavor will transfer in when they use it. So you see a lot of, if you're drinking some sorts of porters or stouts, you're gonna see this in there a lot. Um, and it's actually not a very high percentage of the malt that goes into the beer. So even when you're drinking a stout, majority of the malt is this. And then they add the different colors and they'll add different roasts. So there's different roast levels that go up. Um, the other ingredient that you see on here is, is hops. Um, so these are pelletized hops. So basically, and this is the most common form used today. Um, they're basically what it is is once the hops are picked on the vines, they go through a processing machine, they're kiln, they're dried, they're pulverized, and they're put, made into like these little rabbit food pellets, right? Um, if you can smell them, if we had smell vision this is a, an Australian um, hop called Ella, um, and it's very, very pungent and bright and citrusy. Um, on the different hops, you, you, you rub them together on your hands, and your hands will warm it up, and it releases a lot of the oils. And it's amazing the different aroma notes that you can get out of these. Um, today, there are dozens and dozens of hops out there. And there's hop breeding programs in multiple parts of the world where they're constantly cross-breeding hops to create new flavors, new aromas. Um, and that's why you see a lot of that come out in all the, the new IPAs. Um, that's how you're getting all of these amazing like um, tropical fruit characteristics and all these different kind of fruit notes that are all coming out of this plant. Um, the other form you might see every once in a while is called whole cone hops, which aren't used as frequently um, because they take up a little bit more space. But basically, it's they're taking the flower of the hop plant and instead of pulverizing it down into a pellet, they're basically leaving it and kilning it like that. So you still have the whole flower and you can break it open and inside there's all this little yellow sticky resin and that's the lupulin and that's, that's the really good stuff and that holds all the different oils um, and compounds that give you all of that flavor and aroma. Um, the other main ingredient about if beer is water um, and every different region and brewery has its own different water. Um, water's 
the majority of what you're, what's in beer. And um, basically water has really dictated how styles have grown in different parts of the world. Nowadays, um, with the understanding of modern science, um, brewers will um, adjust their water with different um, salts to get the water profiles that they want. So for instance, with this beer we go, we'll go into later with the Hazy Big Swell, they made water adjustments. And those water adjustments will affect the play between malt and hop so that you don't get a big hop, hoppiness. Um, there's water adjustments made in this beer. Um, because you want different type of water profiles to get a desired flavor and a desired mouthfeel and a desired you know, aroma and how those ingredients play out. Um, the final ingredient is yeast. So there's um, yeast active in these behind me, the fermenters. So right now, um, the yeast is kind of like the magic workhorse in beer. So actually, since we're here, why don't we go and we'll kind of walk around the brewery and show you the brewery what's going on in here. So um, we're lucky enough to be in Hanakoa and we decided to shoot here just because we figured, you know, why not show where the beer is made and give everybody an idea of what it looks like. Every brewery is different, but they kind of have all the same main components. So behind us, what you've been looking at are the fermenters. And this is sort of the, the almost the final stage of where the, where the beer is. So within these tanks, um, the, the final wort goes in, and this is where they pitch the yeast. Um, so in this tank in particular, you can look down and you'll see that action going on. That's actually carbon dioxide coming out of the tank. So there's beer actively fermenting in this tank right now. And all that is is the blow off carbon dioxide. So as the yeast works, it's creating alcohol and carbon dioxide. And you have to pressure out, like, out that carbon dioxide. So it's just going into a bucket full of sanitizer. And that beer will go and go and go. So this is a pretty active fermentation. As you can see, it's kind of rolling a lot. Um, and as it goes, that will die down. And the brewers will check what they call the gravity, which is the amount of sugar in the water at various points to see when it's done. And um, each beer has a sort of a different finishing gravity point that a brewer shoots for. And the brewers will check it. And then when it gets down to that point, then they know the beer is done and it's ready to move on. So this is kind of like the final stage. We're going backwards. So then if we come this way, um, I'm going to take my beer with me. So this is the rest of their brewery. And again, every brewery is different. Um, they're all laid out differently, but they kind of have all the same components. So here at Hanakoa, this is where their, their water is. And this is where they'll treat their water. They'll heat their water. Because um, the brew, you need hot water. It's basically like making tea. So the water goes into these tanks first, gets heated up, and then it gets transferred up here. So that's the brew deck. Um, and you'll see these in different breweries of varying different sizes. So the brew deck, it starts off with the mash tun. Um, so basically the hot water will go up into the mash tun and it gets mixed with the crushed malted barley. And what they do is you take the malted barley and you need to crush it open because you need to get the hot water to get into the barley. And that's where it can start to extract the sugar. So basically, you're just making barley tea. And in there, you're going to extract the sugar. And that's what the mash is. So as it's sitting in the mash, sugars are being extracted. And it's getting to sort of the, the consistency that they want. And for each brew, it's different. Hanako's setup's a little different. So um, they have this contraption. Um, it's actually pretty cool. You won't see another one on the island or in the state, but they're pretty common in Europe. It's called a mash filter or a mash press. Um, and what this allows them to do is get really high extraction. And what happens is, so after the, gr the grains and the, the um, wort is out of the mash tun, they pump it into this mash press. And you see there's different diaphragms. Each one of these is a diaphragm. And what's really, really cool is the wort goes through all the way in here. And then it, it gets squeezed. So these things compress with compressed air. And then what it does, it's separating the barley from the wort. Because you have to separate, you want the liquid. You don't want all the leftover barley. That stuff's done. Um, so what happens is it goes through here, and then it gets pushed back out. So then what's coming out is clear liquid. And that liquid's going into the boil kettle. What's left over in each one of these diaphragms is all the leftover malt. Now, in other breweries that don't have a, a system like this, um, basically at the bottom of the mash tun, is all of that leftover barley that has to get scooped out. Um, 
In smaller breweries, it's manually scooped out. So hundreds of pounds of wet, hot barley get scooped out. And locally on the islands, I know most of the breweries, they send it off to farms. So it either goes to pig farms um, and, or, and animals eat it, right? Because it's really good for them because there's still a lot of sugar in there and there's still some proteins in there. So it's really great animal feed. Um, so it kind of keeps the cycle going. And I know all the farmers are stoked to have it. So once the, the it's, at this point, it's still called wort. It's actually not called beer yet. It goes into the boil kettle. Boil kettle pretty much does that. You're boiling the wort. Um, you're pretty much doing it for a couple of reasons. You're going to boil it to sanitize it. You're going to boil it to add your hops. And you're also boiling it to, um, you can add, it, it increases color. Boils can range from anywhere from 60 to 90 to much higher, depending on the beer. But it's all pretty much similar. Um, and from the boil kettle, once it's done and it's achieved that process, that's when it gets chilled and sent back over to the fermenters where we first started. Um, from there, once it's done fermenting and it sits and it's to where the brewer wants it, then it, pack, it gets packaged, right? So from there, it's either gonna go into a canning line like this. So this is a, a relatively small canning line um, or it gets kegged and then it gets to us to consume, right? So if we go back, um, That's the basic setup of the brewery. So um, like I said, most breweries are going to be the same. It's just they vary in scale. They vary in equipment. Um, so the fermenters behind me, um, they're not very, they're, they're, they look big, but you can go to some breweries and these things are three or four stories high and, and they're holding thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of, of fermenting beer. Um, so the scale is just enormous. It can go up and down. And, and that's the really cool thing about brewing is that it can be done is something as small as a homebrew kit up to, you know, industrial size. And it's, it's something that like, I think that's why beer is so appealing to people is because it's, it, it's so approachable. Everybody can do it. I mean, I started off, I started off um, homebrewing and that's how I got into this. And um, I think that that appeals to a lot of people. So the thing I wanted to note for everybody is we are going to go through three beers tonight. So if you can't or don't want to open all three beers, it's only an hour and it's a lot to get through. I mean, I've only gotten through that much. I'm talking a lot, but you know, put one on the side. If you want to listen, crack it open later, by all means, go ahead or crack them open and you know, you can finish them later. Um, don't worry about if, if, if this one's half full, put it in the fridge. It's, it's going to be fine. It won't, it won't lose too much carbonation over that time. So um, I want to move on to the second beer because we do have to keep moving on the time. Um, so if you haven't finished this, put it on the side. If not, you know, we'll have a little later. I'm going to put mine down and grab the second one. So second one's from Maui Brewing Company. This is a new one from them. It's called Hazy Big Swell. Um, my favorite glass for these type of beers is called a nonic pint. Um, just my personal preference. So many of you might have heard and probably know of Maui Brewing Company's regular Big Swell. Um, this has not much to do with it other than name. Um, they still use the um, same type of hops, Citra Mosaic and Simcoe. Um, but if you were to pour this side by side with regular Big Swell, looks very different, tastes very different. Um, it's gonna smell a lot different too. Um, so yeah, this one. And part of with this class, what, we, what I wanted to do and what we wanted to do is focus a little bit on local breweries, which we have two here. And there are a lot of amazing breweries here. We'll kind of go over that in a little bit. Um, and then focus something on some, an, an imported beer um, because it's something that, um, I'm a big Belgian beer fan, so I wanted to do that. So this is why it's called Hazy. If you do a comparison to the first beer, you can see the dramatic difference. Um, and Hazy, very clear. Now, when Hazy IPAs first kind of started coming around five, six, seven years ago, it was kind of a big pushback from a lot of brewers because most brewers work their entire lives to never have a beer look like this. Um, their, their goal is to make a beer that looks is brilliantly clear. And um, brewers revolt it. But customers and consumers 
were overjoyed because the flavors and the, the taste of hazy IPAs just kind of won everybody over. So at the shop, what a lot of times we do is people say, you know, they're not really into IPAs. We tend to try and make them try a hazy IPA because the thing with hazy IPAs is that they're the bitterness and the whole point of them isn't necessarily just to be hazy. Um, it's so that the bitterness is softer. You're not getting that really strong tongue lashing resinous dank bitterness that you get say in your traditional West coast IPA. Um, instead you're getting a much softer rounded bitterness that plays very nicely with the malts and then a huge amount of tropical fruit flavor. So it's on the aroma. You're going to notice, I mean, this thing smells like fruit and there's no fruit in it. And that's this really cool thing when we talk about hops is the, the amount of varieties of hops and the way they've been able to process hops and the new inventions in hops have allowed brewers to create beers that have these, I mean, incredible pineapple. I get a lot of guava out of this, you know, and they're, they're, they're spot on aromas and flavors, but they're fully coming out of this green little plant that grows on a vine. And it's really, really cool. So in this beer, they actually use this T90 pellets and they use um, cryo hops. So the cryo hops basically are, they're frozen. All the leafy green material is gone and all they're kind of getting is basically the pixie dust of the hop plant um, is the best way to describe it. And it's, you don't get any of the vegetal because there's still vegetal matter in here, right? Uh, that's why it's green. But when you get these new forms, they have, they have new types of liquid hops, the cryo hops, the, the hop growers and hop processors are filtering out all of that vegetal matter and just getting down to the juicy good parts and all those oils and compounds that the brewers want. And that's going to play off in all of these beers. So most hazies started off being hazy um, because one, copious amounts of hops are going in onto the backside. So a lot of times in the brewing process, you're going to hear hot side, cold side. Hot side, we saw that over there, right? That's the boil kettle, the mash tun. That's when you're making your tea. Cold side's over here in the fermentation. So when you're putting hops in the hot side, that's where you're extracting a lot more of the, the IBUs, the bitterness and, and um, those flavors, right? When you're putting stuff in the cold side, it's more aroma and softer. You're not pulling out as much bitterness, but you're pulling out all of those flavor compounds and different types of oils. So with the hazies, there's so much hops that are put into the cold side that you start pulling out these really, really beautiful flavors and you're like le lessening off all of that bitterness. Um, it's about five to seven years ago, we started to see this style emerge. And since then, it's now by far the most popular and most asked about style at our shop. And it's not just our shop, it's around the country. Um, every brewery is making a hazy IP now, most every brewery. Um, all the big breweries are making hazy IPAs and it's because the consumers love them. And it's, it's also a beer where you find people like, oh, I hated IPAs until I had this. Um, because they all thought IPAs were just meant to be bitter. And there's actually a lot of really, um, a lot of skill that goes into making this type of beer. At first, like I said, brewers really just put it off. They said it was lazy, lazy brewing. You're just, you're not making it. But to do what brewers do to get these flavor compounds in there, have that soft pillowy mouthfeel. And that's a big characteristic about these is that they don't have an abrasiveness. They're a bit softer and rounder in the mouth. That's difficult to do. Um, so even with this, there's not a lot of bitterness there. You still get a lot of fruit characteristic. You get that kind of lingering um, fruit notes down the back of your throat, but there's nothing abrasive and harsh. And there's a lot of balance in there. And I talk about balance a lot because when you do find really well-made beers, you're going to find that balance where not any one thing's kind of popping off the charts or grabbing you in different ways. Now, sometimes that's good. You know, if you want a big rough triple IPA that you want those hops to tear your, tear your tongue apart, that's a good thing too, if you want it. Um, so here, um, Maui 
basically created a hazy version of their big swell. Um, glassware. I'll go into the glassware now. Um, so as you can see, I have a lot of different glass here with me. And we get the, I get this question a lot. Do I drink it out of the can? Do I pour it in the glass? What's the best glass? Um, at the end of the day, it what, it's what makes sense for you. It's what you have. Um, would you drink it out of the can? Yes, it's fine out of the can. Um, with this beer, you're not going to get as much aroma out of the can. Um, with these big aroma beers, the one thing out of the can, you, your nose can't smell what you're drinking. Your smell is a large portion of what you're tasting, right? You're going to get all that in. Um, the different beer glasses kind of have emerged from tradition. And, you know, you'll see this is a traditional, it's called a no-neck pint. Um, it's got the little bulge there. You'll see it traditional with English ales. So that's why it works really great with IPAs. It works really great with all kinds of different ales. The other one that most people will see is my water glass. So this is called a shaker pint. It's the most common beer glass you'll ever find. It's because it's cheap. It's really cheap and it doesn't break. It's thick glass and it stacks together really well. It was never made for beer. It was made to stack and make drinks with um, and serve water. It works fine. The problem with this glass is that you don't really have enough head space. So when you pour in a beer, if you want enough space for that head. Um, with the shaker pints, you never get enough, but it works perfectly fine. So if you have one, use it. Now, what you'll find with other beer types or, or beer glasses, so the crushed Hellas, this is a traditional Hellas stein. Um, you go to Oktoberfest, you're in Bavaria, this is a liter, it holds roughly about 32 ounces. This is what you drink. Um, you'll find half liter glasses, you the same thing, the dimple, it's traditional. They're kind of a little more, more rounded, holds 16 or so ounces. Um, it's a great glass if you feel like drinking 32 ounces. Um, you'll also find different beer glasses from the different brands. So in Belgium, um, you'll notice there's a bunch of different beer glasses here. They're all branded. So. I'm, Particularly in Belgium, the brands like to have their own designed glass. And it's um, sort of a branding thing, it's a marketing thing. They all do something different in a sense for that beer, but they're all branded. So this is a Duval glass. As you can see, it's deep, it's wide. This is my preferred glass for drinking Belgian beers that have a lot of carbonation that end up having a lot of foam because it's got a big area up here to allow that head to rise and then dissipate as it slowly goes down. Um, it's a great glass, you know, and then you have, you know, Orval, Westmala, they're all very similar, but very unique. And what's really cool is if you go to Belgium and you go to most any bar, you will be served the beer in the glass. So if you order Orval, most of the time they will only serve it to you in an Orval glass, no other glass. Uh, I was in a pub uh, outside of Brussels, and we ordered a uh, Gudendrock, the cousin of this beer, and they did not have any Gudendrock glasses left, so they would not serve us the beer. They asked us to pick something else. Um, until, like 20 minutes later, they came back and said, oh, we got glasses back, we washed them, you can now order your Gudendrock. Um, and that, it's just sort of, it's, it's, it's not just a branding thing, it's a, it's, this is how the beer is supposed to be served. And it's really cool, um, and it, it's, it, it was, it is. So um, the beer, beer glass is very, I always say, pick what works for you. This is a Tiku glass, um, very popular in American craft brewers. Sleek, it's sexy, it's fancy. Um, I think Beer Lab's got some of these coming out for the anniversary that are super cool if you get your hands on them. Um, yeah, they, these are really rad glasses. Um, I tend, sometimes I drink my, my beer out of a, a stemless wine glass. It just works. It's, it's, it's sort of find what fits for you. Um, so, you know, collect what you want. Delirium, it's got a, you know, elephant trunk on the, as a stem. Um, so local brewing scene. So part of it, you know, with this is obviously featuring local breweries. We couldn't feature them all, but you know, what's super important right now is that we have a strong, thriving and growing brewing community. Um, Village wouldn't be around, Village would not be able to exist without these breweries because 
the way this industry works is we need them to be around to create this community and create this um, place where we have customers and, uh, and coming around and they're going to the brewery. So when I talk about these ingredients, I'm not the brewer. I'm a consumer and a fan just like everybody else. And the cool thing about having breweries around is, you know, if, if you want to learn really a lot more about this, the brewery is right here and you pull up, you come in, you sit at the bar, the brewers are around and the brewers at all of these places, they're friendly, they're approachable. They have the knowledge. They love sharing the knowledge about what they're brewing and how they're brewing it. The same with Maui. If you go over um, to Maui on, you know, and to the, the, the brewery there, brewers are so, so friendly and so knowledgeable. And that's, I think that's such an important thing in creating this community is that we have these breweries here and they're all doing different things. So in the last 10 years, it's really just gone from nothing to a lot. And it started, you know, as a sort of a, a renaissance, you know, you had Maui Brewing Company come up and then things just started to roll. And on Oahu, you know, Honolulu Beer Works, Jeff opened up down the street and then, you know, things just started moving. And it was really cool to see everybody riding off of each other, competing with each other. Competition's good, right? I mean, it's not a bad thing to have a lot of breweries. In, 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 in Kaka'ako alone, you know, where village is, Honolulu Beer Works is a block away. Hanakoa is a three minute walk. Aloha Brewing, where we shot some of the promos, they're four blocks away. Waikiki is a block from that, right? Um, everything's close. There's a new brewery, Lokahi, that's opening up um, in this area. And then you go over the hill, you have Lanikai, you have Inu, and then you have Beer Lab with their different locations. You know, just on Oahu, um, Stubom in, in downtown is starting the brew again. And, it's exciting because every brewer does something different. They want, they're into different things. Like I said, you know, Josh from Hanako and I have this really shared passion for traditional German lagers. Um, other brewers are into different things and that creativity is what kind of really, really builds the craft brewing audience. And without that, sorry, see, we're in a brewery. If you get in that noise, that's the brewery. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's the cool thing. And I, I really encourage people to get out and visit your local breweries. Um, go to them because um, supporting them builds the whole community. If you're interested in beer and interested in the stuff they're brewing, those are the places to go to because they have the brewers that are going to be able to tell you about things. And it's cool because I'm telling you, you can pull up, to, pull up to the bar and you'll find a brewer or two in multiple breweries. So, um, I think there's a lot more room in the local brew scene and you're going to see more breweries pop up, which is awesome. Um, per capita, we don't really have a lot of breweries. So a lot of people sometimes think, Oh my God, there's so many breweries coming along, but per capita Hawaii is still pretty low and there's a lot of room for creativity and there's a lot of room for more beer to be made. Cause most of these breweries are small. They're not making a ton of beer yet. And, um, that allows a lot more experimentation, experimentation and trials. So, um, I don't know how far along you guys are on this beer. Obviously, I'm still not that very far, um, but I have to drive home too. So um, if you guys are ready, take the Golden Drop out of your fridge right now. Um, this is a beer that you can drink a little bit warmer. So a lot of times we get asked about serving temperatures and whatnot. For the first two beers, I like to serve them cold. Um, and I always say I prefer to have my beer served to me cold and then I can decide at what temperature to let it warm up to right so there are beers that you might want to drink closer to 50 degrees 48 degrees 45 degrees right but when it's served to you it's going to be normally around 38 degrees but you know I like to sit enjoy my beer and if I want to have it come up I'll just have it come up to temp so if you want to take this out now you can um because it does not need to be ice ice cold um some of the, the deeper, richer notes will come out as the beer warms up and it gets expressed. Because again, with, with your tongue, the colder something is, the less you can taste of it. Um, it's also a reason why some big breweries tell you to drink your beer practically frozen. So it doesn't it taste like nothing, right? Um, you can't taste anything when it's frozen. So we can move on to the Gouda Drop right now. Um, I'm gonna put down the Hazy Big Swell. 
hopefully you guys got some stuff to eat as well for this. Um, I, I, I threw out some suggestions on the event bite page. Um, I think my favorite would be like a really, really nice charcuterie board and cheese. Um, just because you can play with that on each beer um, and you know, different cheeses, different meats can play with each one. Again, another good one is Chinese food. Um, it really works good with all three of these beers, especially this one. Um, so hopefully you guys got some food, keep you going through this. Um, so we'll crack open Gudendrop. This is a really cool beer from a very cool brewery in a very cool uh, part of Belgium. So I've had mine sitting out for a little while, so mine's gonna be warmed up. Um, and if you did receive a glass, mine's a, a little different than what you guys got, but hopefully you guys got your glasses. Um, and I want to thank Gulendrat because um, they sent us the glasses for everybody. So, um, and then the keychains and everything else you guys got, that all came from the brewery. Um, so if you got your glass, use it. If not, use what you got available. And heads up as you pour this, this beer is much more carbonated than the other two on purpose. <laughs> I'm not going to do that fancy pour I did in the, the promo thing where it spills over, you know. All right. So this is a bigger, this is a big boy. It's 10.7% uh, in alcohol, right? 10.7%. Um, yep, so we're ending, we're ending with the bigger one. Um, it's, let's see. Belgians like strong beer. They drink a lot of strong beer. Now, something people always ask about, how much head, you know, why foam? Um, I've had people say they, you know, they prefer these glasses because they want their beer filled to the very top. I get it, sometimes they just, they want every ounce. Most of these glasses too, they're 14 ounces, not 16 ounces. So you're not getting a pint. When, when people serve you stuff in this, it's 14 ounces. Um, pet peeve. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, you want foam. It's one, it's beautiful. Two, it's allowing carbon dioxide to be released and up into the air. And that's important because that's how you get aroma. You know, if you're not pouring the beer out and you're not getting that come up, you're not going to get any aroma. Um, and again, the aroma is a big part of what you're tasting. And without that, if you're not pouring it out, you're not going to get that. Um, it's also another reason I sometimes suggest to people to pour out their beer into a glass is it does release a lot of carbon dioxide. So you have certain volume of CO2 in each one of these beers. Um, when you do pour it out into a glass, that CO2 is getting released out. So you are degassing the beer a little bit. So if you always wonder like sometimes like why maybe sometimes beer will get you full. Um, if you're drinking straight from a bottle or a can, you're getting all of that CO2 right down in there. If you do pour it out into a glass, whether it's coming from a can or a bottle or on draft, it's allowing at least some of those volumes to get released, right? Um, so Gudendrock 9000, this is a Belgian style quad. So basically quadruple. And the name comes because it's quadruple the strength of a table beer, basically. And in Belgium, they're pretty simple. Um, you got a single, you got a double, you got a triple, you got a quadruple. No one's tried to make a quintuple yet that I know of. Um, but um, quads range anywhere from 10.7 up to about 12, 13% in alcohol. Um, they're big. They're meant to be big warming beers. A triple is going to be eight to ten percent. Triples are normally much lighter in color, so a triple is going to be much lighter and, and more in the line of a color of of a crushed Hellas. And then you have a double, which tends to be much dark, a bit much more brown in color than this. Then you have a single, which is normally like a Belgian blonde. Um, so Gudendrock has a pretty cool story, and I'll go into what the beer is after I kind of give you guys a story. So golden drop means the golden dragon, which is hence why you have the golden dragon on there. Um, it's brewed by Van Steenberg. Um, and it's a small brewery, relatively small brewery, big brewery, um, north of the city of Ghent, which is in um, 
the Flemish speaking area of Belgium. So Belgium's country like this kind of looks like a oval shape ish. Um, one half French speaking, the other half Flemish speaking. Um, Flemish is just a sort of a dialect of Southern Dutch. And um, Ghent is a beautiful medieval town. And the Guldendrak is named after the golden dragon that's on the bell tower in the city of Ghent. And so if you go into Ghent, there's a gigantic bell tower in sort of the middle of town and way up on the top, and it's a couple hundred feet high, there's this gigantic golden dragon. And that golden dragon has a really cool history. And that's what I love about sort of old world breweries because there's so much kind of history to them. Um, this golden dragon, the story goes that um, around 1000, year, the year 1000, 1033, our Norwegian king was uh, sailing towards the Crusades and he was going on the Crusades and he had his fleet of ships and he had this golden dragon with him. And when he got to Constantinople, he gifted it to the emperor of Constantinople. And at that point, Constantinople, Constantinople, modern day Istanbul was still under Roman Catholic rule. So it was still a, a Christian kingdom. And the, the dragon was meant to go on to the, um, the gigantic church there, which now is a mosque. It never made it up there. About a hundred years later, it ended up in the hands of a, a Flemish trader who brought it back to Bruges, which was sort of the, um, the townspeople of Ghent revolted against sort of the, the ruling prince of, of Bruges and they won. Spoils of their winnings was this golden, this golden dragon. So they took the golden dragon and mounted it on top of the bell tower. And it's been there for hundreds of years. And it's, that's where this um, brand gets its name because they wanted to pay um, homage to the city that they're from. 9,000, it's, the it's the postal code of uh, Ghent in, in Belgium. So um, really cool brewery. They make uh, a couple other brands that you might know, Pirates, another one. They're, they're known for making really big, strong beers. Um, high in alcohol, but dry. And that's the cool thing about Belgian beers. So you can see this beer has a much darker color. Um, and that's because, well, they weren't, definitely weren't using chocolate malt, but they were using a higher roast malt in very small percentages. Um, when you get into some of these higher roast malts, some of them have um, sugars that basically the, the, they're non-fermentable. So they leave sort of a bit of sweetness in there too. Um, Belgians like to experiment with their beers. So we talked about the first beer being a German style Helles, right? The Germans famously have the Reihanskabut where it was basically a law saying you can only use the four, three ingredients and they, they didn't know about yeast back then, but then finally yeast. Belgians were completely opposite. They just threw everything in, you know, whatever was available. So one thing that they like to use is what they call candy sugar. And that's where you get some of the color and that's where you get some of that sweetness. So what it is, it's, it's a crystallized sugar, caramelized sugar that they put into the brewing process, the hot side. Um, and it adds color and flavor. Um, the beers fermented with a really high active yeast that can ferment a high uh, gravity beer. And then it's re-fermented for a second time they call bottle condition. So that's where you get that higher carbonation rate is because basically a lot of these beers, so most beers you're gonna find they're carbonated in the brewery, packaged exactly where the brewer wants them to come out, right? A lot of Belgian beers, a lot of German beers, they go through a secondary carb carbonation in the bottle um, and they want that. It's also why you see a little bit thicker bottles on some of these. So you get a higher carbonation. Um, part of that, um, it's also a refreshing thing. So the higher carbonation cleans your palate. This is a perfect beer. When I'm talking about the charcuterie and cheese, if you have like um, stronger, heavier cheeses, like a Rochefort or something like that, it's great. Um, so question? Yeah, so thank you. We're kind of getting close to the one hour mark and just want to let everybody know too, you know, uh, we may pass that seven o'clock mark, but feel free to stick with us. Uh, we're going to be answering some questions um, as they come in. Uh, so Stacy asks, you know, what beer type is easiest to hide flaws 
and why? <laughs> um, well, hopefully no one's hiding flaws, but um, it happens. Um, basically, the more flavors you throw in a beer, it, it's easier to hide to a point. So you have, I, I, I kind of break it down, and, I, and this isn't a derogatory way of, of re referring to things. You have beer flavored beer, and then you have beer flavored like other things, right? So um, what's really cool about the American craft brewing scene is that the creativeness that brewers have had, they're like, well, how do I take a beer and make it taste like this? Um, and to add different ingredients to it. So, you know, if you throw a ton of coconut on top of something or a ton of chocolate, um, it starts, say if that base beer had a flaw, you could hide it. Now it also comes with throwing all these adjuncts could also add issues to your beer. So they are volatile um, ingredients going in there. So we've had beers where they're, in the brewing world it's called adjuncts, right? Where that could be coconut, chocolate, whatever. Anything that's not the, you know, the core beer elements, they're called adjuncts. And some of them are great. Like in Belgian brewing, they put coriander or grains of paradise, which is a type of like pepper or candy sugar, orange peel, right? Um, but those things can introduce issues and flaws to your beer as well. So we've had, you know, different stouts that have a lot of adjunct ingredients in them. And if they're not stored properly, they turn very fast. Lactose is one of them. So it's milk sugar, right? Um, they use that to create mouthfeel, bigger body, a creamier body, and it adds a little bit of sweetness. But if that beer is not stored right, not packaged properly at the brewery, lactose turns sour very quickly. Awesome. Um, so some people are asking, you know, what is the process to become a Cicerone? Uh, some people, you know, that might have been their first time hearing of, of what a Cicerone was. Sure. And what we've been saying is it's a Somali of beer, right? But it's maybe not quite exactly the same. So if you can give us a little insight on that. Sure. It's, I mean, basically everybody says Somali of, of beer because it's the closest um, comparison. The, the level I'm at is nowhere near, say, the level of like a Chuck Faria, who's a, who's a master sommelier. Um, there is a level of Cicerone that you can test to that is the equivalent. Um, I, I don't know what the number is up to yet, but at one point it was maybe like 15 or 20 people in the world. It's a four-day test. It's incredibly difficult. Um, you have to have a palate like a master, uh, master sommelier. Um, basically, um, a company was formed because they realized that the beer world was evolving, craft beer world was growing. Um, they needed a standardized sort of um, system for beer experts. And they created a system and it was a test. So they have different levels of tests. And I think now there's three or four levels of test. Um, and you study, you take a test, you do off flavor. So it's a two part test, there's a written part Actually, it's three part written, a presentation, and a tasting part. And if you pass the three with a certain amount of score, you get your thing and then you move on. Um, the, the master, Cicerone, I, I don't know if I'll ever be ready for that. Maybe when my kids are in college, I might have time to, you know, um, you got to dedicate a lot. I mean, I, I know, I, I knew someone in California who studied for it for a year, and it wasn't just passively studying for it. I mean, it was like multiple days a week for an entire year studying and he didn't pass. And the guy was incredibly intelligent, well-versed, knew his stuff. It's just hard. I mean, it's hard on purpose. Awesome. Um, so as you know, uh, everyone listening on the call or tuning in today, um, feel free to submit your question through our question and answer function on Zoom. Uh, we'll try our best to get them answered. Um, so there, there's a lot of different, you know, types of audience we have out here. You know, some are maybe a little more beginner, maybe some are more advanced. So for the beginner type, uh, what would you recommend for someone who is just getting interested in beer? What, what's a good approach? Come to Village. We'll help you out. Um, um, no, I, I, I joke, but I'm serious. Um, that's part of what we love doing there is um, kind of jumping in that journey with everybody. And um, beer's daunting it's it's complicated and um it's far more complex than wine and that's not a, a slight at wine it's just with beer the flavor ranges are infinite right and in wine 
you have not to simplify, but you have white and red. You have ranges within that, but most people know like I don't like red, I want white. With beer, you can go from everything that's from this to something that tastes like to chocolate cake, to sour beer, you know, to IPAs that are bitter that it can touch on every touch point on your tongue. And it's daunting because you go to the beer aisle now and it's just a sea of labels and names, right? Because it's the same as like trying to, you know, if you're looking at like a French wine list, right? And you, and you, you don't understand French, all of these names. And then everybody's getting fancy with graphics because you want to stand out. So it's like, what's a Belgian quad? How is that different than a Belgian triple? What's an Abbey beer? What's a Trappist beer, you know? And there are all these things on the label. So I think the easiest way to start out is just start trying something. Go into your favorite shop, whether it's Village, somewhere else, and just say, hey, I like this. Can you point me out a few things? Um, and honestly, it's just about trying things and seeing what you like, where your palate goes. Um, be open to trying new things um, and being surprised. Cool. Um I know we we're kind of briefly talking about this earlier with the glasses. Uh, some of them have an etched design or a little groove on the bottom of the glass. Can you maybe explain to people what exactly that's for? Sure. I think what you're referring to is on some glasses, um, you probably won't be able to see this on the camera. And I don't think you, well, Gudadrock might have it on it. But um, so in some glasses, particularly a lot in Belgian glasses, they'll put a, what they call a nucleation point. So it's basically a, a laser etching at the bottom. Normally it's branded. So on the Duval glass, there's a little D etched down here. In a delirium glass, their famous pink elephant, there's an elephant etched. It's just a laser etching. It's just an agitation in the glass. And the idea is that it creates that, the, the stream of bubbles coming up from the rest. Aesthetics, right? You, Again, it goes back to brewers in, in, in particular, they want their beer to look beautiful. And if it's sitting there in the light and someone sees it from across the room and you have this beautiful liquid sitting there, color, and you see this thing coming, all these bubbles coming up, it's transfixing, right? That's the other reason for the head, right? You see that in that contrast of colors. Um, it's a visual thing. So you're, you're, you're drinking with your eyes on that. So of course people want to know, um, you know, in terms of your favorite beer, uh, and I know that's probably a hard question to ask, but what is, what is, what might be one of your more favorite mainstream beers or maybe a beer outside of the U S that you've tried that you really like? Um, I really, really, really like English cask ales. You can't get them here. Um, if they're just impossible to, to get, it's just because of the, no one makes them. Um, there, there are a few breweries uh, in the U.S. On, on the mainland that, that make them, and that's pretty much all they do. They're just incredibly difficult to make, and, and a brewery has to be dedicated to it. Based, um, you got to go to England to get them because they're just they're they're meant to be fresh. Like you, you have to consume them within a couple of days of when they get put on tap. Um, though that's one of my favorite style of beers that I, unless I'm traveling, I never get to have. Um, I. I've become, I've gravitated back to being a gigantic, you know, lager fan. Um, Pilsners and Hellas's and Kolsch's uh, in an ale, but, you know, I, I just appreciate these type of beers so much more now. Um, I think a lot of people make that, that journey, and it's kind of funny that when you get into craft beer, you get into beer in general, you look for the, the craziest flavors. You want the stuff, like, you know, 20 years ago is the triple IPAs and the Imperial stouts and the barley wines. And then it's like, now you everything overload. And then you start to gravitate and you find your niches. Right. And, um, a lot of people just gravitate back to like, Oh wow, that Pilsner is just so perfect, you know, and you appreciate the simplicity of some things and, um, how well made something is. Awesome. Uh, this is an interesting question, kind of has to do with um, the brewing communities. Uh, what area, and I'm, I'm guessing this is geographical area, uh, might have the best IPAs per capita? <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I only know what I taste and what I like. Um, it, everyone's different. You know, people will argue about things. Um, to be, to be completely honest, I mean, and I, I, this is what I, I tell people, it's personal preference, right? Like I'm not the biggest hazy IPA fan and it's, it has nothing to do with the clarity or whatever. It's just my palate. I'll try them. I enjoy certain ones of them that, you know, catch me, but it's just not my thing. Um, I tend to like classic West coast IPAs. So I still go back to like, if I get a pint, Pliny the elder as cliche as that is, it's like, it's a perfect beer for me for an IPA. So for me, I look back to like, there's breweries in Northern and Southern California that hit the sweet spot for me. Um, but for other people, New England might be the home of the best IPAs because they're into that really big, heavy New England style, hazy IPA, um, or other people who, you know, Portland, you know, the Northwest where they, you know, they want a more malt balance. It, it just depends really on what you're looking for. And IPAs now it's so varied, so diverse. Got it. Uh, so Natalie asks, so there was a mention of adjustments to water during the processing phase. Can you elaborate on the adjustments of water? Sure. Um, and I'm by no means an expert on this. This is where um, going to breweries is always awesome. And I highly recommend if, if you ever get a chance, take the brewery tours or if um, Beer Lab does really great um, classes on these and take them because the amount of in-depth knowledge you get from them is fantastic. But um, basically, water has different minerals in them, right? And they have, um, it varies from place to place based on your geology, right? So in Hawaii, we have a certain mineral um, composite of what comes into our groundwater because all of these breweries are pulling groundwater, right? Um, breweries in Southern California, they're pulling water um, from the Colorado River, basically, right? Um, breweries in Northern California, pouring them from the Sierra Nevada. Breweries in Pilsen in the Czech Republic have different type of water. So in the Czech Republic, the water is very, very, very soft, which leads to them making that type of beer. Whereas you do, you know, in London and, and in um, Dublin, they have harder water. Led them, to, brewing those type of, you know, darker beers made more sense. Um, the adjustments that they make is to, bring the water composition, the mineral composition for the style of beer that they want. And it's basically, you're adding different um, minerals and salts to play with that. So if you want a better, you want more hop assertiveness, right? You want the hops to be brighter and bang and a little bit more bitterness, you're gonna change something. If you want the hops to be, so with, with hazy IPAs, that's one of the big things that they figured out is, if you adjust some of the water chemicals, um, you're gonna get a better play between that malt and hop, but you're not, you're not accentuating the hop bitterness, you're accentuating the hop flavor, um, and you're gonna play with that. And pH has a, plays a difference in that too, right? So your acidity of your wort plays a, diff it plays a, a factor in that too. Awesome. Um, interesting question about percentage of alcohol in a, in a beer. Um, how do brewers, I guess, arrive to that? And maybe um, is there a certain desired range that they're always trying to hit, you know, when they, when they brew a certain beer? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, beers have been categorized and stylized, right? Um, specifically in the, in the US, um, and then that's sort of become the dominant um, style guide. So at some point, they started grouping styles together. So IPA, um, Hellas's. And all they did was look at all the common traits between these beers. And then you have your ABV kind of range, right? It's out the window in Belgium. They don't, there's no such thing as styles. They just do whatever the heck they want. Um, but so when you're making say like a Hellas, right? Um, they don't want something that's super boozy. It's meant to be light, refreshing. You can drink this much of it in a sitting and not fall off, you know? Um, or two or three of these, right? So. 4%, right? Um, in England, with the Cascales, why I love them so much, it's not uncommon to get something 3%, you know? Um, it's meant to be nourishing, sustaining, 
you can have a few and not get you completely drunk. Um, whereas there's other styles where they're just brewed to be stronger and bigger. Um, and so most brewers follow those kind of guidelines. It's also what you want. I mean, you can make triple IPAs, right? You can have IPAs that are up to 11, 12, 13. Uh, Dogfish 120 is 15, 16% alcohol um, for an IPA. Uh, American craft breweries, which is the, the awesome thing, they take innovation, they do what they want, right? They break, they break rules that other maybe traditional brewers wouldn't do in other countries. So it, it really just depends on what they want to do. Awesome. So we have someone on here that likes summer ales. Mm -hmm. um, any suggestions in a direction where that person should go for summer ales? Yes, I, I, I don't know if, if they're referring to, so in England, there's a style called summer ale, which might be a little different than say summer ales that you know get brewed here. Like Sam Adams makes a summer ale, which is light and crisp. It has kind of like some of a citrusy note. Um, that's a tough one. If, if they're referring to like sort of those English style summer ales, it might be a little different. Um, but uh, there's a lot of blonde ales that have been coming out, um, and that's just because a lot of um, American craft breweries are making those. Um, so I, I, it's, that one's a hard one. Um, and as far as like English summer ales, they're, I, I haven't seen one in a long time. <laughs> uh, someone has a question about brewing sours. Yes. Uh, is that a different process, or can, can you give a little insight into sure. what um, that's all about? Yeah. So. Um, the, the sweatshirt I'm wearing is from a sour beer brewing, um, brewery in Belgium. So they're, they're a Lambic brewery. Um, sour beer is different. It's complicated. There's different types of sour beer. It's, it's hard to, you know, sour is a very broad name. Um, and there's a big range in between there. So um, the original sour beers, all beer was sour because they didn't have stainless steel. They didn't know about yeast. They didn't have chemical cleaners. They didn't have sanitizers, right? So when they brewed beer, if it wasn't consumed within a few minutes, within a few days, it would start to get sour because you had bacteria that would get into it, um, lactobacillus and other bacteria, and it would start to spoil and it would start to get sour. Um, now in some places that flavor became very desirable. So in, in some of those places, um, Belgium, for one, that flavor profile was very, very desirable. So um, in the same region that this is brewed, you have Flemish reds and brunes, um, and they're basically sour beers where they, they're, they're inoculated. So basically the, the brewer will brew the beer the same way. And then once it's in here, they'll throw in different bacteria. So it's not clean yeast. So they're either throwing lactobacillus or Brettanomyces, which is a, a, another strain of yeast. Sometimes it's called wild yeast because it used to be wild, but now it's just all gathered from a laboratory. Um, but it produces a lot of um, different flavors. There's also Lambic Brewing, which is from the Brussels area. Um, and it's one unique area that does it, but brewers all over the, the world have done it before. Well, basically it's called open fermentation and spontaneous fermentation where you brew the beer, you put it into a big shallow cool tray they call them a cool ship. Basically, it's a cooling vessel, not too deep to allow the beer to cool. You brew it in the cold, colder months. You open all the window slats, let the cold air in. But what comes in with the air is the climate. And there's microbes and all kinds of stuff in that. And it lands into this wort full of sugar. And it's going to go to work. And then all of a sudden, you have spontaneous fermentation. That beer becomes sour it's not necessarily sour is a very broad term for it but it becomes interesting it becomes tart and acidic you know acidity is one of those things and then they put them into oak barrels and they let them sit and just like a a, a, a winemaker they'll you know these these lambic brewers will taste different barrels some will get so acidic they're like vinegar and other ones will be softer and they blend to the right profile. And then sometimes they'll add cherries and it becomes a crepe. Or they'll add, you know, raspberries, it becomes a frambois. Um, and it just depends, you know, they add, and then, you know, they start experimenting and they add peaches or whatever. So um, 
sour beers are, are unique. There's also what they call kettle sours now. So um, lactobacillus is uh, a, you know, a bacteria that they have, you can buy it, and it creates a very tart flavor. It's the same way you get yogurt or you get um, same things like in kimchi, right? Or sauerkraut. Lact lactobacillus will sit in there and it'll acidify whatever it's in there and it'll eat the sugars, right? And brewers will use this to do a quick kettle sour. And then that's how you get a very tart, highly acidic beer. Yeah, so I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Sure. Um, here's kind of a fun one. Okay. Uh, beer bucket list or brewery bucket list. Uh, do you have one? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I've been lucky and very fortunate to have traveled a lot. Um, been very bummed over the last year. I haven't been able to go anywhere. But um, so Cezanne du Pont in Belgium. Um, I've always wanted to go there. It, that beer, Cezanne du Pont, was the beer that sort of Belgian beer was what got me into beer. Um, I, my, my brother was, was older than me. He got me, he like, he was introduced me to like Rogue, Dead Guy, and all these other beers when I was uh, younger. Um, so I had an introduction to, to craft beer. But I had tried Cezanne du Pont, I think I, I might have been like 21 or 22. And I just couldn't believe what I was tasting. And that, so I started chasing Belgian beers. And um, I've been to Belgium a few times. I've never made it to Cezanne du Pont. Um, there's a small brewery um, south of there called Fantome, another Cezanne brewery, um, bucket list. It's in the middle of nowhere. He, he's elusive, but he makes really great stuff. Um, and I, I do want to get to Schneider in, in um, Bavaria. Uh, I like German Hefeweizens, and it's also just another fascinating... My, bu my bucket list is all European for the most part. Um, the Czech Republic would be the other one, just because... Um, there's just such a, a vast amount of history there and the way they do certain things like at Schneider, they, they just, they still do things in a way that like no one else does. And they're still open fermenting their Hefeweizens and they're still brewing things in a, like a non-conventional way just because that's the way that it's done. And they said like, you can't change it and it doesn't get better if you change it in their opinion. So it's just cool. Awesome. Awesome. Um, last question. Uh, this is kind of specific to village. Sure. Um, any plans on expanding or any, <laughs> any big plans? Uh, some people want to know that. Um, yeah, yes, we, we've, we've worked through this past year um, and we've been very blessed and fortunate to have amazing like customers and followers and supporters. And um, Darren and I can't thank everybody enough for that and our staff as well. We, we are actively, you know, looking at expansion we have a few things going on um it's just a matter of time you know we've we've always tried to be intelligent and smart and uh calculated in what we do but um i think as the demand is there it's something we're definitely we we want to make sure that people can get the beer that they want where they want close to them and if more people are excited about stuff like this that just gets us excited because it's, it's awesome Cool. Did you want to say anything else to wrap up here? No, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, again, um, I am um, humbled and, and pleased to be here. Um, if you guys have more questions, feel free. You know, you guys can always email or, or, or Instagram. You can message us. Um, come into the shop. That's what we're there for. Um, this is what is fun. It's fun sharing our passion with people, and we, we'd love to see you guys again. Thank you so much.